All right. Yay. Hello. Welcome back to the Vasm Assembly podcast. Um, this is episode four. And today I have another exciting guest, as almost always, like all my guests have been exciting so far. So it's actually always, always. And um, this time I have Ryan Hunt from Mozilla on. Um, Ryan, who are you and what do you do at Mozilla? Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, so I'm on the Spider Monkey team at Mozilla. So we work on the JavaScript virtual machine, um, which includes a WebAssembly virtual machine inside of it. Um, I'm the team lead for the WebAssembly group. And so um, I do engine development, technical planning, coordination, and um, also I represent us at the WebAssembly community group doing standards work um, of all different sorts. That sounds very exciting. Um, so if, if there's anything you can share about the team um, at Mozilla working on WebAssembly, like how big are they? How many people are they? Are they globally distributed? Is it all um, people working remotely like you? Or like, how does it work? Yeah, most of Mozilla is um, remote workers. And I've been remote ever since I joined Mozilla in like uh, 2016 or so. Um, I live in Minnesota. We have the SpiderMonkey team is, is larger because we have a lot of folks working just on JavaScript. Um, for the WebAssembly um, team part of it, we have, well, let's, I'm bad with numbers, so let's hope I don't exclude someone, uh, four people total. Um, so it's me plus uh, three others. And two of us are in Minnesota. Um, one of us is in Europe. One of us is in Canada. And there's another one in, uh, somewhere else in the Midwest US. So we're kind of uh, all distributed, but somehow like three of us are in the Midwest, which is kind of... Uh, I don't know how that worked out. That definitely wasn't planned. Cool. Um, so can you just give us an overview of what you've been working on as the Spider Monkey team in the last year and maybe give us an out view, outlook on, on things um, you're planning on working in the next year or next quarter? Yeah. So uh, our team works on, like there's, I think, as you probably cover in the podcast, there's a lot of random things going on in the WebAssembly world. And it's kind of... Uh, hard to track sometimes. And so like our team is equally scattered at times. And so we'll have a lot of random projects that we're working on. And the projects take a long time too. you know, like we'll do some work on a proposal and then that proposal will kind of stall because there's not consensus in the community group or some more work needs to be done or they need to validate some part of it, which requires some work on tool chains. And so we'll have a lot of stops and starts. We'll like do a month of work on a proposal and we'll need to kind of like pivot off and work on something else. Um, so about a year ago, um, if I remember right, it feels like a different world. We were working pretty heavily on the WebAssembly GC proposal because um, that was a kind of run up to us trying to move that to phase four and release it that fall later that year. And so um, we had an implementation for a long time, but the spec changed significantly. So we did a lot of work of implementing it and doing optimizations and testing it. And we shipped that around end of year last year. Since then, we've done a lot of optimization work on it to make it faster um, because the initial version we shipped was like all right, but like there was a lot of room for improvement. So we've done a lot of that work this year. And then since then, we've had, I think, kind of three major projects. Um, one was we've been doing work on the JavaScript promise integration proposal. Um, I've also been working on the JavaScript string built in proposal. Um, those are two ones that we're trying to get um, like full implementations of and also kind of push through the standards process. And then sort of like away from like feature work, we've been also working on a big re-architecture of our um, engine, specifically our comp compilation pipeline to support um, inlining and other kind of advanced optimizations that the WebAssembly GC proposal really needs. So that's been taking up quite a bit of time, and um, but it's kind of fun and uh, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, you don't always know when you start a project like that where you're going to end up, but uh, um, been making good progress on that. And then we've also been doing a bunch of small projects um, in terms of like we've um, finished up our implementation of the Memory64 proposal, um, doing some preliminary research and um, on the memory control proposal, and then um, the exception handling proposal like finally moved to phase four this year. And along with that, there was some um, some standards work and some implementation updates that we need to do um, this is around the exception ref feature. So um, we're doing that and we hope to ship that one pretty soon. Hmm. Sounds like a pretty busy couple of quarters and uh, yeah, 
past and, and, and ahead, obviously. Um, I want to just quickly talk about Wasm GC. Um, like what is the most impressive Wasm GC app that you've used uh, in Mozilla so far? Yeah, so uh, probably the most exciting application we've been able to use was recently we got access to be able to run uh, Google Sheets using WebAssembly GC. So it was really exciting. Amazing. The neat did, did they make it hard that, by uh, by UA sniffing or something and uh, excluding Mozilla or? There's some like experiment flags you have to sort of opt into, but and I think what I had been told was there's some internal details on there and they had to sort through. Um, I'm sure it's hard when you have like a big application used by like a lot of people that you don't want to break anything. And so um, also there was um, they used the JavaScript string built in proposal, which I mentioned earlier, and so there was some work to make sure that. Um, Sometimes when you develop a standard, uh, you kind of write out this big overview doc, but there's some ambiguities in it. And so like the fun of the standards is you have to like uh, get multiple different implementations to actually coincide on all the details. And so we had to resolve some issues with that. But once we did, it didn't take too long. It just all basically just worked, which is kind of like um, it's a, an exciting thing. And it's a real application too, like an, um, which is cool. Because sometimes when we develop a new feature, we'll see sort of like toy apps and things like that, which are hmm. cool and promising, but I always like when it's a real application and, and that people don't even, can't even tell like, oh, this is, this is using WebAssembly. I didn't even know. Yeah, totally. Um, and just to clarify, when I said uh, lock Mozilla out um, by UI sniffing, I meant from the Basm GC branch. Um, so obviously you can use Google Sheets, but it would maybe then um, go back to the JavaScript um, backend. And um, so fun coincidence, yesterday I was listening to a podcast um, where someone from Row Zero um, was being interviewed. Um, I think it was the, yeah, the, the Browser Tech podcast was a really good one, actually. Um, and they talked about um, how they built Google Sheets, um, but sort of streamed from the server and then the UI is locally um, built. And um, I just wanted to jump in and say, hey, wait, uh, you're not talking about the latest and greatest Google Sheets. You're talking about the JavaScript backend. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so um, yeah, I guess that's probably um, so far the biggest um, deployment of WasmGC out there. Um, but yeah, I was just interested um, in hearing um, your thoughts on that. Cool. Um, so we talked about SpiderMonkey real quick. Um, we will talk a lot more about string built-ins, um, but before we go into that, I just want to get um, like your story on how you get in, got involved into WebAssembly. So you said you joined Mozilla in 2016, I think, um, which is where WebAssembly was heating up, I guess, becoming really a thing and exciting. Were you hired because of that, or like how did you get to WebAssembly into Mozilla? So I started at Mozilla as an intern, and. Um... So I interned the summer of 2016, if I remember right. And the interesting thing was, I think you are right, that was when WebAssembly was especially heating up. And I remember one of my fellow interns at the time was uh, going to work on WebAssembly. And I remember sitting kind of in the lobby. It was the first day all the interns were there, and I was talking, everyone was talking about what projects they were going to work on. This person mentioned, oh, I'm going to be working on WebAssembly. And I, I don't remember if I had heard about that before, but I thought, that's a cool-sounding project. And uh, <laughs> I had originally... Um, applied to be an intern on the JavaScript team, but um, I ended up on the uh, graphics team at Mozilla. So they do all the rendering uh, work for the Firefox. So like if you have Canvas, if you have um, you know, CSS, all that sort of stuff, we they manage all the graphics drivers and actually going from images and things like that to like actual pixels on the screen. Um, I was on that team from 2016 to 2019. And uh, it's a great learning experience, a lot of really fun stuff. But, you know, you kind of work on something for three years. I uh, kind of got the itch to do something new. So I actually kind of I applied at a couple different companies. and I was trying to think about what I wanted to do. And then I saw there was this internal posting at Mozilla for the WebAssembly team. They wanted another engineer. And I said, oh, you know, I've always wanted to work on compilers. And that was actually the jobs that I was looking for at the time. And... Um, I applied for it and I didn't really have much uh, compilers experience. I had, I had some like hobby projects and like, you know, light reading and stuff that I had done, but obviously it had never been my job before. And the nice thing was that it was an internal app, internal posting. And um, my mentor and the person I had worked with pretty heavily on the graphics team before was formerly from the JavaScript team. And so he gave me a very good rep, uh, reference. And so that was enough to uh, uh, get me on the team and 
I still remember when I was interviewing for the team, <laughs> they would ask me questions about different compiler things. And I would say, you know, oh, yes, uh, I've heard of that. No, I've never done that before. And it was almost like, like I just had to keep repeating myself. And so, you know, I was like, I went, and they just kept interviewing me. They're like, oh, let's do another interview tomorrow. And I was like, I don't know why they keep interviewing me because I don't feel like I'm doing so well here. <laughs> but uh, it all worked out and uh, been on the team since. So I think it's about... You know, it's 2024 now, so it'll be about five years or so, give or take. And uh, it's been great. I um, I think I joined the team at a really nice time because um, they had shipped, like, the MVP and done a lot of, like, big, important projects. But um, it wasn't so late in development that, like, it was still, it was a lot easier to understand all the different pieces at that time. Um, now it feels like there's quite a bit more. And so um, I... Yeah, I, I think I joined at a nice time and um, I've loved the work ever since and love the team. And uh, it's been a very great experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that um, WebAssembly is getting boring or anything. There's still a lot of movement. Um, actually, that's one of the things that I want to talk about. Um, so the two of you, um, uh, sorry, the two of us, um, we crossed ways at the um, CG meeting in um, uh, Pittsburgh at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And um, we were talking about, or you were talking uh, rather about uh, string built-ins, which is a proposal that you champion. And um, yeah, I was sort of following that work loosely. And um, I guess some of the listeners uh, are pretty actively following. But like, could you summarize what are string built-ins for the mere mortals who are just listening to the podcast who might be, yeah, have some uh, familiar familiarity with uh, string um, and what it, strings and what it means um, for WebAssembly? Like, what are string built-ins? Yeah. So, you know, the, the context around this is that, you know, like I mentioned, we shipped WebAssembly GC last year, and there's a bunch of different languages that are sort of are trying to target this space, you know, compile from Java, Dart, Kotlin, or any number of other things, Scheme, OCaml, to WebAssembly and use this garbage collection feature. Sort of one of the questions that, come up and they're sort of related is um, A, what should I do about strings? And B, how do I interoperate with, you know, other things in the browser or other like potentially JavaScript apps? And the issue is that the WebSummit GC proposal gives us like really simple building blocks, support the garbage collection features of your language to WebAssembly. You know, it's, um, it's basically structs and arrays. And so it's possible to compile like your Java string to a um, WebAssembly GC array, but um, because they're so, so simple of types, they are, you know, you can't pass WebAssembly GC array to like, you know, as a URL to like the fetch API. It doesn't work that way. And so you kind of quickly run into, that's great, I've compiled my application to WebAssembly GC, but how do I like use all the different DOM APIs and things like that. So the if you are using these WebAssembly GC types like structs and arrays, um, the simplest thing you can do is do a copy from that type into like a JavaScript string and then pass that JavaScript string to whatever DOM APIs you have. And this is sort of like the state of the art for C++ and Rust applications that target WebAssembly right now, because they will have their strings inside of WebAssembly linear memory, and so they have to do a copy. Um, copy from that linear memory to a JavaScript string and then pass it to a DOM API. Uh, the problem is just that it's a copy and it has overhead. And, you know, like a big part of the like benefit of WebAssembly is that we're supposed to be fast. And if you have to, you know, copy a string every time you call Web API, that's not great. Um, and also another thing that kind of comes up here too is some languages have string types that are very different from JavaScript strings. Um, they have different encodings, different semantics. So they're not really quite a good fit for that. Like um, Rust's string type is very different from the JavaScript string type. But there are a lot of GC languages that were coincidentally developed around similar timeframes. And so they made similar decisions about strings. Like Java, their string, it is different than JavaScript strings, but they do, like if you kind of squint your eyes, they can kind of be very similar. Um, they use similar encodings and a lot of times similar techniques. So um, for, like we mentioned, Google Sheets, 
for them, they really wanted to reuse the existing JavaScript string implementation in engines to avoid copies and to be able to um, also reuse things like the regular expression engine that's already just built into every browser. And so the JavaScript string built-ins proposal is sort of a way to make that accessible for Google Sheets. Um, it's already possible that you could, um, like WebAssembly is pretty flexible. You could, um, it has a type called externref that you could store JavaScript strings in. And you can also import functions to do whatever you want. So you could also import a lot of code that kind of manipulates JavaScript strings. You could import like a get car code at function. And the difficult thing is that when you do it through imports and extern ref, um, there's, uh, there's just a lot of overhead to it. Um, a lot of times when you, if you do an import of like a get car code at, um, there, the engine has to peel away a lot of glue. It's like a it's a call from WebAssembly to an import that's unknown. That import turns out to be a JavaScript code, which you might run in the interpreter or a JIT, and then that code calls back into the engine. And so there's a lot of overhead for like a what really should be just a really simple operation of I reach into the string and grab a character. And the operations are so small that all that overhead really dominates and you really don't see a huge benefit to doing that. And um, so this proposal provides a special way to import all those operations into WebAssembly in such a way that engines can emit just about as fast a code as they can do for JavaScript. And so it kind of like makes it so that JavaScript strings are things that you can use inside your WebAssembly module just as well as you could from, say, JavaScript, um, bring it kind of to parity. So I guess when it comes to strings, something that always uh, confuses developers um, is emoji. So if you have certain emoji and you uh, do, uh, I don't know, happy face dot length, uh, it gives you one or two or something. And then if you have uh, whatever, uh, black family hugging together, it gives you length five. So all these whatever confusing things with how emojis internally work with uh, zero width joiners and stuff. Um, you have Unicode 16 and you have Unicode 8. Um, like, how does all of this happen to be somehow implementable um, in a way that um, different programming languages can agree on a way that, um, yeah, just makes sense for WebAssembly? Because, yeah, as you said, um, all program languages are slightly different. There are some commonalities, but so differences. So, like, how, how can you how can you break this down so that um, WebAssembly can make sense of it? You say developers are confused by strings, and I'm I'm a developer too, so I will throw myself in there. I'm confused by strings too. Um, <laughs> there are, you know, you could almost fill like, you know, a page of all the different, like, independent choices you could make about a string type in a language. Like, are they immutable or are they uh, mutable? What encoding do you use? Do you use UTF-8? Do you use UTF-16? Is the encoding even observable? What's the unit that you're indexing is? Is it something called Unicode scalar values? Is it Unicode code points? Um, does do you kind of always have to be well formed, which I think might be subsumed by some of the other things I mentioned there. But like, it gets really confusing really quick. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of different programming languages have made slightly different and incompatible decisions. And those things are also like observable and relied on at times. And so this is sort of a discussion that we had um, earlier in the community group because uh, JavaScript string built-ins as a proposal was sort of a response to a different proposal to add a actual string type to core WebAssembly. And um, the problem, in, and this is sort of, this was also a contentious discussion at the time about the different directions to go, which does happen in the community group at times. So I'm only representing my opinion here. Um, I think that trying to find a universal string representation or something that like, you know, can be used by all these different languages semi seamlessly is just a very difficult problem that I don't think people have solved before. And I'm not going to say that it can't be solved um, or that there's not a solution. It's just a really hard problem. And so what I kind of wanted to do with this proposal was sort of a different approach, which is I'm not trying to create a new string type or define some like pick all the right options of all the different possibilities of strings. We're just trying to take what does JavaScript do and make that accessible to WebAssembly? So if the JavaScript string type like matches your language, like Java or Dart or Kotlin, like well enough, 
then you can use it. If not, you'll want to do something else. Um, so we're not trying to create a new string implementation. We're just trying to make the one that's already in the browser um, efficiently usable from your WebAssembly app. And even if you're even if your language uses a different string type, there can be some benefit to like, having more efficient conversions between your language type and the JavaScript string type. And uh, so it's, it's trying to solve a little bit of a, a smaller issue, I suppose. You mentioned performance before. So a lot of people assume JavaScript is slow and WebAssembly is fast. So the intuition there probably is most of the times right. But then counterintuitively, you say, um, we're calling from WebAssembly land into JavaScript land, and um, this would be faster. So you mentioned the overhead is in the copying. Is there some sort of um, break-even point where if it's, you know, you just copy a small amount of string um, values over, then it's faster to just go WebAssembly. But if you have whatever, 100K string, then it's worthwhile um, to hook into the JavaScript implementation. Or is this completely like does doesn't make a difference? So it kind of depends a little bit on what language you're compiling the WebAssembly. If your language has like a dramatically different string type that you could use JavaScript strings as like the building block for it, um, but it would be slower to do that versus if you hand rolled it using WebAssembly GC arrays and structs and did your own string optimizations really suited for your language. Because different languages have different APIs like string builders and different patterns for how they construct and access strings. So it's possible that you might be able to do better than the default JavaScript string implementation in browsers for your own specific suitcase, uh, su uh, use case, not suitcase. And um, <laughs> so you might be able to do better than the, the built-in implementation. But um, then at that point, if you you know, roll your own implementation, you have the cost of having to convert between your version of it and JavaScript strings when you want to call into APIs in the browser like fetch or regular expressions or whatever. And so it kind of becomes a question of how often do you do that? And when you do that, how big are the strings? And and also how like fast can you make that conversion as well? Maybe you cache values and things like that. So we kind of just we're trying to provide like the the basic building blocks and tools that like tool chains can use here, not trying to solve everyone's potential issues. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how people use it. And um, this is just like our first kind of step here in this area. There could be different approaches we take in the future, but at, at the very least, this is kind of our, our first step here. Yeah, so the proposal is called string built-ins, but like if you read the explainer, it starts with uh, sort of saying it could start with strings, but there's other um, things like reg apps um, that you mentioned before. Um, there's a ton of global objects in JavaScript that could make sense to expose. Um, what do you think is the most low-hanging fruit for the next built-in? Could it be regex? So regular expressions could be a good one. Um, I'll be honest there. In that area, I don't know the intricacies about how JavaScript VMs handle regular expressions and what kind of optimization opportunities we'd have if we defined built-ins for that. But that is one I've heard from other people. And so um, that one's sort of on my radar. The, In my opinion, like one of the biggest one is probably array buffers and typed array views. So if you have one of those, making it so that you can very quickly access elements inside of it from WebAssembly without having to call it to JavaScript, I think that would be a pretty big win. There are also at the last WebAssembly community group meeting, there's some interesting presentations where there's some people compiling to WebAssembly GC, but they also really need to be able to access JavaScript numbers and JavaScript booleans and JavaScript big ints from there efficiently. Um, some of their use cases are sort of exotic, so I don't know necessarily if it makes having a proposal for those, but we definitely could, we potentially could have built-ins for JavaScript numbers and, and JavaScript big ints because those are, um, you know, it, it's, it is sort of weird because we already do have numbers and things like that in WebAssembly, but JavaScript numbers and big ints are just subtly different and for some languages they really want like seamless interop with existing javascript code and existing javascript code expects numbers and biggins and things like that they does not expect um does not expect like WebAssembly i32 values and so that's a potential use case too that i've heard hmm. and um before i go to the next question which is about uh, javascript uh, glue code um i just want to get to uh, maybe 
a pretty stupid question that I have uh, as someone who has very little compiler, compiler backend um, background. Um, so if you have a language like Dart um, or Kotlin, um, this language does have code for strings. So if you want to compile that um, to WebAssembly, but you want to actually then use the uh, JavaScript built-in strings, um, do you just rip that uh, language's string implementation out? Or like, how does it work? It's a good question. Um, the answer I can give is probably hand wavy because um, I'm not like the developer of those languages, so I don't know all the requirements. There's um, one of one possible way is so like if you have like for example in Java, I believe the string type in the Java language is an object, and when you compile that to WebAssembly GC, objects has like it's a it's a class hierarchy. And so the actual string type can be converted to an object if I believe, if I remember correctly. And so the actual string type in WebAssembly will have to be like a struct that is a subtype of the Java object struct. So you'll need to have that. But that struct, if you're compiling just to WebAssembly GC, likely would contain a pointer to WebAssembly GC array that would contain all the character data. You could change that character data array from being a WebAssembly GC array to be a pointer to an actual JavaScript string that actually has all the character data inside of it. So um, it, it kind of depends on which language is compiling to there about what sort of like requirements for how their string type looks. But at some point, you probably would replace the pointer that points to like the character data that instead point at a JavaScript string. That would be my guess for the best way for languages to use it. All right, so it's complicated. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so. I was going to ask you about JavaScript glue code because like you can um, write JavaScript glue code that would um, expose um, yeah, like string functions directly to WebAssembly. So from WebAssembly, you could call those. Um, what is the trade-off? So when, when does it make sense to think of something as, hey, we should really have this as a built-in versus, hey, um, JavaScript glue code is just um, good enough? Is there, is there some sort of trade-off? Is there some break-even point? How, how do you make the decision? One thing I do want to say first about that last question I remembered after I had finished my answer. So uh, one thing our, our team says is that there's no such thing as stupid questions. We try and embrace that a little bit. And uh, so, for example, we have a, a monthly stupid questions meeting where the whole team gets together <laughs> and we have a big document and we write the very, very generic or, or not generic, but very I guess I would just say stupid questions that we can think of. And um, it's surprising about how many really good questions come out of that because areas like, like I had mentioned, I, I didn't have any compiler experience when I joined the team here. Um, that is the case for like a lot of people. And there's JavaScript virtual machines and website virtual means machines are so complicated that you can be on the team for years and years and years, and there's some very, very basic question that you never got around to asking. At this point, you're kind of afraid to. So giving permission to people to do that was like a really big win. So um, I, I, anyway, I thought that was interesting. So the question about glue code. Um, so the big problem with glue code is there's a little bit of overhead whenever you go from like a WebAssembly function to a JavaScript function, because they just they behave differently. They have different rules. And um, we've, like, inside WebAssembly at in the SpiderMonkey engine, we've done a lot of work to try and optimize that. So um, when you call an import that's JavaScript, if that JavaScript function has, like, it's been JIT compiled, we will go directly to the JIT. We will not go through the WebAssembly or through the JavaScript interpreter. Um, and the JavaScript JIT code has a different um, ABI or application binary interface than WebAssembly JIT compiled functions. And we've done work to try and make all those conversions um, work efficiently. And so like, it's it's definitely something that you can optimize. But sometimes when you're calling into something that's doing such a small amount of work, the, the fastest that we can get it is still going to be slower than the actual amount of work that you can do. Um, like to try and put it in concrete terms. Um, when you call, like, and this depends a little bit on the engine about how they compile WebAssembly code and how they handle imports. 
at least in Spider Monkey by default, um, when you compile, when you call an import in a module, that becomes a uh, what we call an indirect call at the um, actual like assembly level of the processor to something that's unknown because we compile a module before we know what the imports are. And then that indirect call goes to somewhere which needs to um, enter into JavaScript code. And so that'll do some conversions between data types. So it'll say like, I have a WebSemi I32, I need to create a JavaScript number. So it'll do that. And then that will do a um, another indirect call into the actual JavaScript JIT code. And this is like the fastest path for it for when it has been JIT compiled and it's not just running the interpreter. If it's an interpreter, it's even slower. And then that JavaScript JIT code will need to execute and it, you know, if it's say that function is just really simple, all it's doing is doing, you know, string dot get car code at index. Um, that will then, uh, if it's JIT compiled, hopefully it's been compiled enough that it implements like the very fast string inline operations that we do for JavaScript when we've really heavily JIT compiled them. But if not, it may actually have to call into the virtual machine, which it'll do sort of another indirect call into something that'll do conversions to like how the virtual machine's API works, the virtual machine will run, and then all that has to return back the same way it came. So like it can be really, really bad in cases like that. Um, it is possible for engines to, um, on the WebAssembly side, we could potentially like, I know I'm getting into the weeds here, I'm sorry, but this is sort of my job, so this is the things I think about. That's what you here for. Often. Um, on the WebAssembly side, when we're comp we could recompile WebAssembly functions after we've known the imports and specialize it to whatever import we have. So we can see I have an import that actually turns out to be a JavaScript function. And that JavaScript function has specific bytecode that I recognize, which is like a string dot get car code at. And it could like speculate and try and remove all that different stuff because we live in the world of JavaScript VMs, which do a lot of like uh a lot of very intense optimizations. And so it's like anything's possible. But once you get to that point, it starts to be um, the thing you start to run into is like performance clips. It becomes fragile. So what happens if that bytecode subtly changes the the language, you know, used to be doing string dot get car code out for an index, and then I do it slightly in a different way, and we don't recognize that pattern because we're kind of doing pattern matching at that point. And so a big goal with having string built-ins is to avoid the need to have to do all that intense pattern matching and, and speculation and just really provide upfront to the WebAssembly module when we're compiling it that, hey, you're just importing the the, the very well-known string get car code at function that you know about. It's You've implemented it. And so you know when you call this import that you're going to end up here and you can just emit the fast thing that we already do for JavaScript. And it'll even be faster than JavaScript because JavaScript has to tear up through all the different tiers and collect profiling information and guard it and potentially have bailouts for if you know you change the string prototype or something crazy like that, which does unfortunately happen at times. And so um, it's just trying to provide that information in a very straightforward way that WebSemi modules can really easily use um, so they don't have to use glue code. And, uh, and, and one last thing, sorry. The, so I mentioned all those different indirect calls and conversions and all that. What it can turn into if you use a JavaScript string built-in is just, I know I'm calling the get car code at function. And so I will just emit code to like go from the string pointer, grab the character data array, do a balance check, index into it, and pull it out. Um, plus a couple paths for some exotic string representation stuff. Um, but it can be much faster in those cases. Yeah, I was, I was just uh, making going to make a remark about um, the work that has gone into making um, calling into JavaScript land faster from WebAssembly. I remember a great blog post from Lynn Clark from a couple of years ago where she goes into a lot of detail and, as you say, into the weeds of this and uh, how, how it's uh, going to be faster. Um, maybe I'll link it into um, that document from the, from the show notes. Um, so talking more about um, problems that can occur. So you have a string built in um, and one of the problems that the explainer mentions is this and I'm <laughs> funny enough this is always a problem with JavaScript uh, obviously always but then also like uh, operators like uh, JavaScript strip triple equal um, which I guess is pretty exciting um, even for uh, 
pure JavaScript developers already. So confuses a lot of people in the beginning with uh, the type coercion, co coercions and so on. So can you just elaborate a bit more on uh, what this means for string built-ins? Yeah. So when you write a proposal for like an addition to WebAssembly or other standards, oftentimes you have to like consider what are all the possible alternatives of things that we could do here? Because um, that inevitably comes up of, you know, you propose something and someone says, well, why don't you just do this? Which um, oftentimes, like sometimes that can be like a very valuable question, but um, sometimes you've thought about it and you just need to have an answer available for it. And in this case, this was, um, you know, when you, when you import in WebAssembly, you provide like, some sort of function. So it could theoretically be the case that when you provide the imports for a WebSemi module, you could provide like a string dot prototype dot get car code at, which is like a JavaScript function that's available on the prototype. And you could provide that directly to the import. But the, the getting in the weeds here, one problem with that is that that get car code at function expects that when you call it that this parameter to that function is the string that you want to do the operation on. But in the WebAssembly semantics for how you call an import that turns out to be a JavaScript function, the this function that you call, when you call the WebAssembly import, you pass all these parameters. None of those parameters corresponds with the this parameter that JavaScript expects. So whenever you call a JavaScript function from WebAssembly, the, this parameter is always the undefined value in JS. So there's no way to actually provide that easily. Um, this is a problem that people have talked about solving in different ways over time, and I think you may have a solution at some point. But by default, there is not really like a good way to do that. So if you import the string that prototype to get car code at function, call it from WebAssembly, it's always going to throw an exception because it's going to say, this is undefined. I, you need to pass me the string you're doing it on. And so there's just no good way to do that. And then the, the thing about the triple equals is, is also sort of the is similar to that, where you're, you're trying to like, WebAssembly can just import a function. And, but JavaScript has lots of non-functiony ways of doing things. Like if you want to compare two strings for equality, you have, you do like triple equals. Um, and, um, but triple equals is an operator. It's not a function that you can actually import. So if you wanted to like have a JavaScript function that does equality, you would have to like define a new JavaScript function, which is what I, when we talk about glue code, that's usually what it means. You're defining a function that does some operation. And so in that world, you start getting into pattern matching again, where you see I have a JavaScript function, you need to inspect its bytecode to see like, oh, it's just doing triple equality. That's all it's doing. And so um, this is sort of like another one of the problems that the string built-ins proposal tries to solve is that we just define a, a JS string equals function that they can import. That will basically all it does is triple equals, but we provide it in the function form that WebAssembly needs it to be. They just remove all that kind of, all those irregularities that JavaScript as a language has and just provides it in the, the form that WebAssembly needs, which is a, a function they can call. I see. So talking of uh, yeah, actually using this. So as a JavaScript developer, um, I'm opting into string built-ins by passing my WebAssembly.compile function as the second parameter, pa parameter uh, a new options uh, object with built-ins uh, as the value, uh, sorry, as the field, and then an array of the possible built-ins that I want to pass. In this case, it's only JS-string as a as a possibility, but it's designed, I guess, to be open for other built-ins that maybe that we may have in the future, um, which like is kind of interesting because it immediately raises the question, and it's actually what I wanted to ask you next. But we can actually combine this. Um, what is the polyfill story there? So if uh, I happen to run on a browser with my WebAssembly code that does not have built-in support quite yet, um, how how would it work? Yeah, I think your summary for how you can use built-ins is correct. When you're compiling a WebAssembly module, it's a it's a flag that you provide, you opt into it. You say, I want to provide the JS string built-ins to this module when I'm compiling it. And um, and yeah, we've made we've tried to make this extensible so that in the array, in the future, if we have array buffer built-ins or things like that, um, those are extra options that you can provide. By default, none are provided when you compile, which allows um, people to have like kind of fine-grained control over that. You know, if, if you want to um, do something different, you're you're perfectly able to do that. And it also keeps backwards compatibility um, that 
if for some reason some language out there was importing things with that exactly that same namespace and thing, we're not going to break that, um, even though it's pretty unlikely. But that's a thing that we think about sometimes. Um, so when you say namespace, you're talking about the VASM colon namespace? I'm sorry, the, what I meant by namespace, which is not the right term for it, is um, when you import, there's the first field, which is like the wasm colon JS dash string. And then the second one is like the thing you're importing from that, that module. Um, but so when it comes to like the, I think you asked about the namespace too. Um, the, there's been some of the discussions about what exactly the namespace should be. You know, should it be wasm colon, should it be wasm dash JS colon, um, I don't think we fully have a, um, I don't think we fully have an answer on that. I, we're currently in phase three in the standards process. Um, I think those are some things we're going to kind of revisit in the last one and uh, bike shed through all those details. But the intention is that the wasm colon is the namespace because these are WebAssembly built-ins. And so we're just going to claim a namespace for that. And then the JS dash string is just trying to identify that these are JavaScript strings that you're importing. Um, and then, so the polyfill story, like I mentioned, this this is something that you opt into when you're compiling them semi module, you say, I want to provide this. It's equally valid to just say, I'm not going to provide this. I'm not going to provide the host built-ins from the browser. I'm going to provide them myself. So if you don't provide that flag for WebAssembly, for the JS string built-ins, what happens is that when you instantiate your module later, um, you need to provide those imports. And so you can provide your own imports that uh, do what the JSString built-ins do. Uh, and, and that would give you complete flexibility if you wanted to, like, I don't know, like, if you wanted to log every time you called equals, you could provide a JavaScript function that, like, does a log and then does the equality and returns the result. So um, so if you want to polyfill it or do any sort of, like, um, things that you normally can do with imports, just don't provide the flag, which would mean that you don't get it from the browser. You have to provide it yourself and then provide whatever version you want. So, and uh, um, the actual like um, polyfill for this is fairly straightforward because it's, these built-ins are, are not doing a lot of logic. They're basically just, you know, taking two parameters and doing equality on them or get car code at, things like that. So it's, it's a pretty easy polyfill. The biggest thing you'll just run into is just there might be different performance characteristics if a browser doesn't implement it. Um, but that's pretty standard for polyfills. I see. And I guess this also helps with uh, uh, another question that I had. So string built-ins and built-ins in general assume the presence of a JavaScript engine. But um, you may have run times where um, it's not given that they have a JavaScript engine, like, yeah, let's say, something that it targets embedded devices. Um, but then, as I said, you could probably just uh, polyfill um, the built-ins with whatever means of your environment and, and work like that. Yeah, that's that's sort of the intent. And um, every different runtime can make their own decisions for what they want to do. Um, if it's uh, an embedded system, they might just not want to provide this API. If it's a desktop system, uh, you know, theoretically, they could, you know, provide these built-ins even if they're not a JavaScript environment. Um, it'd be sort of odd, but it's it's kind of it's up to them. I can't really stop them from doing that. Um, the the major thing is just that we're trying to define these APIs in terms of JavaScript, so that we're not trying to have to invent a new string API. Um, and but if people want to in implement that interface on things that are not JavaScript environments, they're perfectly welcome to. The other, th the other option here, too, is that there's a lot of differences between compiling for like a web engine and a non-web engine. If you want to compile for WebAssembly engine inside J JS VM or like an embedded device, there, there, there's more differences than just whether the JS string built-ins is available. Um, there's gonna, you're going to be calling different APIs. Um, you won't be able to do any, you won't have any JS clue code for other things as well. And so um, I think it's likely that or tool chains, languages are going to want to have different modes for compiling for different things. And when you're compiling for a non-web engine, um, you know you can uh, just not use the JS string built-ins API. Um, it does require a little bit extra work, so I think it's important to have the polyfill route for people who do uh, for tool chains that don't do this. But if you're a tool chain that's really optimizing for the web and also not for the web. On not the web, you probably would just use WebAssembly GC arrays for actually storing your character data instead of using the JavaScript string type. And what this also gets you to is that um, 
the APIs are different on the non-web. Like you might be using the WebAssembly component model. And so um, there's just going to be, you, you don't have the same issue of on the web, when you want to call an API, you have to have a JavaScript function or JavaScript string. Um, and so, but on non-web use cases, the APIs are kind of developing in such a ways where they could take a GC array directly um, and avoid a copy. And so there, there's um, just different reasons to use it on the web that don't necessarily exist outside the web. Makes sense. Um, cool. So I want to slightly move more into the pra practical questions here. So um, who are you developing this for or specifying this for? You're championing um, the proposal, I guess, um, as Mozilla. Um, is there some big use case that you have in mind that you want to unlock by this? So just for example, um, on the Chrome team, we work closely with um, the Google Sheets team um, who were wanting um, WebAssembly garbage collection so that they could compile their calc um, engine um, to WebAssembly GC and have best performance. So is there any um, like use case that you have in mind on the Mozilla team that led you to, to driving this? So the uh, use case that you're talking about there with the calc engine is the main use case that I know of for it. Um, we're personally championing it ourselves because um, it's kind of the right direction that we want to see for it. And also it's, I think our team, you know, we're a smaller team, but we also like to pull our weight in the standards process and contribute to it. And so if we see something that like we think should get done, we do try and if we have to champion it, we'll champion it or contribute to it in different ways. And so, um, so that's why we're championing, even though, you know, Google Sheets isn't a Mozilla property, um, so to speak, but it is an important use case. And so that's why we care about it. Um, that being said, there are other languages that do like have interest in it as well. Um, there's an OCaml compiler that I've heard uses it. I think there's a scheme one as well. And um, there may be other use cases. Those are just the ones that are tend to be a little bit louder on the proposal about with different opinions about how things should work. Um, and so I, I think there will be other users besides just Google Sheets, but that's the big like production one that I know of. Hmm. Very exciting. Um, did you do any performance benchmarking um, on Google Sheets, um, Mozilla versus Chrome? Um, and how did, uh, if so, how how was the outcome? That's a good question. So um, like I mentioned earlier, we just recently got access to it. Like I think I ran it like, maybe it was like seven days ago. It was for the first hmm. time. So I was able to do some performance profiling on it for just like Mozilla to find out where kind of like the hotspots and or things. And so we have a couple improvements that we're starting to work on. We've not yet gotten to the point where we're able to actually compare it between um, Google and us. So that's something that we're kind of eager to do at some point. But one of the questions that kind of came up when we started doing this is like, how do you even benchmark a spreadsheet application? <laughs> Just like sort of weird. So we'll probably need to talk to some folks who know more about that to like, what does it mean to have a spreadsheet that's like intensive and like, how do you measure these different things? And so um, we're just starting in, on this. Um, I wish I had more to say, but we're just starting. It's, it's a very contentious topic, actually, even within Google, because on the Sheets team, they do have a benchmarking or it's not technically, I guess, a benchmark. It's just a collection of representative uh, spreadsheets and uh, thousands of those. And I know that they used those to run the um, implementation. Like it's a funny story from the article that we tell when um, they tested for the first time, it was only half the speed of the JavaScript implementation. So it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> it sounds counterintuitive. Why would it be slower? But then eventually they got it uh, to run double the speed of JavaScript. So that's kind of neat. But then again, of course, it's, it's a question of like, what spreadsheet did you test this on? So I guess it boils down to having a collection of representative uh, spreadsheets that you know are going to be taxing on the on the calc engine and then just do so but yeah it's a it's a i guess very exciting just general question how benchmarking WebAssembly works um there was an entire session on that at the cg the community group meeting um in, in carnegie mellon so i guess that's an open-ended question here but before we, we go there um I want to ask more about the next proposal that you're championing, and uh, I guess it's closely related to the string built-ins one, which is called compact imports. So what is that about? How does it relate to um, string built-ins? Yeah, so this is something that um, came up in the JavaScript string built-ins discussion, um, because that proposal uh, has a, a method for how you like you know, JavaScript, if you want a string constant, there's syntax for doing that. You do quotes and you get a string constant value. Um, WebAssembly, because we're just handling everything through imports, 
doesn't have like it's not there's a lot of different ways you could do string constants and it's not clear which way is the best so the way that we're currently settling on for that essentially adds a lot of imports one for every string constant that you have in your your code and um the overhead for that um the way we've kind of settled on doing it turns out to be a my opinion, good enough. But one thing that kind of came out of that is that the binary format for WebAssembly uh, has some repetition and redundancy for modules that have a lot of imports. Because every import has the module that you're importing from and the then the thing that you're importing from the, the module field. I think, I don't know if there's like a great name for it, but, um, and those are repeated every time in the module. So if you have like a uh, hundred thousand imports, but they're all from the same like module, like say it's like, you know, string constants or uh, the common one in script and apps is env, env. Um, you'll see, like, if you look at the binary, it's like repeated a hundred thousand times the same module name. And, um, and getting in the weeds too, there's, um, when you actually instantiate a module, we have to read all those imports from some JavaScript object. And that operation can be slow because it has to redo the lookup for the module every single time you encounter a new import. Um, it's not like a, a big problem that's like the end of the world. It's sort of like a small paper cut. And so the compact imports proposal is trying to be like, what if we just tweak the binary a little bit, change the rules just slightly to like fix this use case. So that's what we're going for um, is a new binary encoding for imports that removes that redundancy and some tweaked rules for how you read the imports object for this kind of common case. Um, I just presented it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, so I don't have time to, I haven't had time to get the overview doc written yet. Um, I just started that recently, so I'll be working on that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a small little thing, but those things kind of do add up over time. Yeah, so we have a link uh, to the proposal and to the slide deck that you presented um, in the show notes. Um, if you look at the, um, textual representation, it really looks kind of stupid that you would have so much repetition. Um, but then, of course, uh, in the binary format, it's sort of different. So I guess my question would be, um, would there maybe be a way to just make the binary format smarter about those so that it, when it recognizes those, it could uh, encode them differently and just make it more efficient over the wire? We could change the binary format. And I think that's probably like the, maybe the, the main way we do this is when you see an import section right now, it's just a list of different imports in the binary, and each time it repeats the module field for it. I think instead, the simplest option would be to um, change it so that uh, you specify the module field, and then you can have you know n different amount of fields within it. So you specify that module field only once. And um, there is some discussion, though. Um, Sometimes when you open up like a new proposal, it sort of becomes like Pandora's box of like all sorts of different ideas of, well, okay, so we could change the binary format, but when we do this, I've got this other idea too that is like also relevant here. So maybe like we combine them two at the same time. Uh, so it's a bit early to say exactly what what the exact solution will be. One thing that's been thrown around is that the component model, the WebAssembly component model has this notion of uh, module linking. And there's some overlap there with um, doing a import of a module. And so one of the feedback items I got from that, uh, the first presentation is, is there a way that we could unify these two things so that we're not having like, you know, a bunch of different ways to do imports that are like similar, but different in like subtle ways that really shouldn't matter. So I just started doing some research on that and we'll see. Um, so I'm sure at some point I'll put up an overview and then there'll be you know, a lot of discussion on it and I'll take <laughs> these things just a lot of stuff happens, but it also just takes a long time, um, I think. Uh, and that's a little bit unfortunate at times, but it also is sort of like a safety valve in the standards process that we don't just like change things too quickly and make mistakes. Um, even though that does, even with that, we still do make mistakes at times, but um, it's just, that's just inevitable. Very exciting. Yeah. Looking forward to, to seeing where this goes and how it goes. Um, one other proposal that you mentioned at the very beginning is Memory64. Are you involved in that as well? We've had implementation Memory64 for a long time. Um, we've not, we, we've contributed a little bit to like the design of it, but not a huge amount because the design's pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward. And 
but we've had implementation for a long time and it's just recently trying to move to phase four, but there was some late changes to it where with memory 64, it lets you use 64-bit integers to index into memory instead of just 32, which unlocks the ability to have more than four gigs of memory. Um, you can have maybe, I don't know, eight or 16 or 32. Kind of lets you join the, uh, I don't know, the modern era of 64-bit computing in 20, 2024. Um, but uh, one of the things that came up just recently in the community group resolved was that uh, web assembly tables currently take 32-bit integers only. And there was a decision we should also generalize those at the same time so web assembly tables could take 64-bit integers as well. So we just recently finished up our implementation of that. We're doing some fuzzing and testing and such. But we're pretty close to being feature complete there, and in which case it can move to phase four, and uh, which would be exciting because that's another proposal that's been a long time in the making. Cool. Um, all right. So I guess this ends up the questions that I had. Um, we've been talking a lot about nitty gritty details, as, as you said, and um, like we got into the weeds a lot. So there's, I guess, a bunch of links um, for our listeners in the in the show notes to provide if they want to dive deeper. Um, so next, I want to talk about the final part of the show, which is always um, VASM, but not. So when you instantiate streaming on any of your streaming devices, what is it that you currently watch or listen to? For some reason, my wife and I like to watch shows from like the 90s and the early 2000s. I don't, don't know how that ended up, but it's just, I don't know, maybe it just feels nostalgic for us. So the we just recently wrapped up watching through Seinfeld and um, Frasier. And, but now we've moved on to watching uh, Scrubs and uh, um, Psych. So we're kind of moving from like the 90s into early 2000s now. Maybe at some point we'll get to the 2010s. We'll see. At that point, <laughs> we might be in the 2030s. But that's what we're watching right now. I remember watching the occasional Scrubs episode. Interesting. Nice. Um, <laughs> cool. The next question I have is, um, if there's one thing that you could local get, as in something that you do, and then global set it onto the world, so as in something that you wish everyone else did, what would it be? And if you want, you can also reverse this question so you can uh, global get something and then local set it on you. One thing I was thinking about is when I think of local, I, uh, you know, sometimes I'll go on road trips or travel across the country. And there's two things I miss when I travel from home. One is uh, there's a local uh, semi-fast foodish chain called Culver's in the Midwest. And I always miss that when I'm around because I don't believe that's around the Midwest. That's outside of the Midwest very much. So that... I don't know it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that that would be probably what I'd say is I, I wish that there was more of the Midwestern chains that I know across the <laughs> world. Um, another one is there's a home improvement store called Menards. And... Uh, I remember when I was younger, you know, you, I, like, pretty little, I was like, oh, yeah, Menards is just a chain everywhere. And then I remember I was a little older and I looked at a map of all the Menards and it's like, it's just the Midwest, which makes total <laughs> sense. And it was sort of like an existential moment for me. It was like, I guess there's just a lot of things in my life that, you know, are just local to here. But Menards is a, is a great store. It's, it's uh, a lot of home improvement stuff. And, but they also offer like groceries too. And it's all, it's all like, I don't know, it's uh, bulk food and just random stuff that for whatever reason, they think that people who are home improvement people want to eat. Um, uh, but it's, it's kind of like a comfort store for me. Awesome. Two more reasons for me to visit the Midwest finally. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so thank you very, very much for being on the show. Um, Ryan, if there is uh, any way people can who are interested in following your work, how can I do so? Are you using any of the social networks, email, LinkedIn, whatever? I'm actually not on social media. I was thinking about that. I used to have a blog, but I never ended up actually really writing much for it. And so I've kind of you know, discontinued that. Um, so if anyone wants to get a hold of me, the best way is probably email, um, which is my first initial R, and then my last name, Hunt, so R-H-U-N-T, at Mozilla.com. Cool. And I guess people can also just uh, star and watch the repos that you work on. So, um, Oh, yeah, I'm on, I guess, ones. I guess GitHub is a social media or a social network. So, yeah, very much um, is, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So if you want to find me, you can go to one of my proposals and then file an issue and say, uh, why do we need this? This idea is terrible. And I will have to show up and respond and defend myself. So cool. So thanks again for being on the show. Um, we will be up uh, in, I guess, roughly four weeks. It's a summer period here, so everything is a little slower. So it might be five weeks, it might be six weeks, but um, you will be hearing from us soon on the WebAssembly uh, Vasm Assembly Show. I'm messing up my own name, Vasm Assembly Show. And um, with that, uh, thanks again, Ryan, and um, listen to you next time. Cheers. Thank you.